book of Acts chapter number 20. And uh, I want to begin my reading today at uh, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall man arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Notice what verse 31 says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I have ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Therefore watch and remember. Father, thank you so much for the reading of your precious word. And now, Lord, as we look at it for just a moment, I pray that you will bless it and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, and I don't know how you may feel, but I believe that we are living in the last days. I believe that we're living in the, what is known as the, the lukewarm church age. Jesus talked about the lukewarm church age in Revelation chapter 3. And I want to bring to you a thought that I've titled, Is Your Church Drifting? Now, I, I do want to say this. Uh, many times, as a child of God, you can drift away from God and the church without even realizing that it's happening to you. And that's sad. The story is told of two fishermen who went to a reservoir to fish. And uh, they were caught up in their excitement of the trip that... They got so caught up in what was going on that they neglected to put the anchor down as they re reached their favorite fishing spot. You ever done that? I, I have. Now, unmindful of the undercurrent of the water that begins to take place, these guys begin to fish. Man, they're catching fish. Hours passed quickly by, and suddenly, one of the men in the boat looked up. And to his horror, the boat was drifting dangerously close to destruction. He shouted his warning to his partner, Hey, pick up the paddle, or we're going to die. And they began rowing with all their might, seeking to escape the deadly rapids and the falls that lay just ahead. And after a furious effort, they finally made it safely to shore. Now the fishermen were shocked that they had drifted off so far. The danger went undetected until it was almost too late. The danger went undetected until it was almost too late. The writer of Hebrews warns us and he says that we need to give the more, listen, earnest heed to the things which we've heard lest we at any time should let them slip. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. It is as if the truth could slip out of our hands. And, and it's as if we could just slip away. 
from the true grace of the living God. Drift comes from a word that uh, simply means being a little careless, permitting oneself to be lost, to shift away from that that we know that is right. Well, the question comes to mind whenever I think of this, when do churches begin to drift? And I want to share with you some thoughts that God laid upon my heart, and I think that it's something that not only we need to hear at Gordon Avenue, but something that the church in America needs to hear as a whole. The first thing that I want you to know is that churches drift when they fail to pass on the truth to successive generations. One of the most important things that we can do as a church is to do exactly what we're doing with our children. I think that it's a special time whenever we bring our children down and we sit them down and we bring to them just a little short thought from the scripture. And that's so important. Listen, if we don't teach our children the precious word of God, then our generation to follow us will fail. And I must confess to you that uh, I believe that that's happening before our very eyes. The second thing that I want you to see is that churches drift when they move away from their foundational doctrines. We're seeing that more and more and more and more today. There are many Baptist churches today that are taking Baptist off their name. Junior Hill, the great Southern Baptist evangelist, said this, if I was ashamed of my denomination, I would change denominations. Let me tell you something. God has chosen to use the Southern Baptist Convention as one of the biggest and most powerful tools for His glory uh, than any other denomination on the face of the earth. But yet and still, our denomination is in a very steep decline. Would it be that we're moving far away from our foundational doctrines Friends, it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way at all. It can be prevented. Listen to what the great Methodist preacher said, John Wesley. John Wesley said this many, many years ago. He said, I am not afraid that the people called Methodist should ever cease to exist. He said, but I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead church having a form of religion without power. This undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast, he said, to the doctrine and to the Holy Spirit and to the discipline which set them on fire. But yet and still the Methodists are not as on fire for God as there was in John Wesley's day. But I must confess to you, we Baptists are not on fire like we once was for the glory of God. Could it be that we find ourselves drifting? Too many people are leaving our churches. Too many people are leaving unchanged, unmoved, unsaved, unfulfilled, unsanctified, and unmotivated to turn their heart and their will over to God completely. There's just too much to do in this modern time. Too many things to get involved in in this modern time that we live in. I don't know about you, but we need a Holy Ghost fire that will cause us to set aside business as usual in the church 
and just pray and pray and pray until Jesus comes and reunite the fire that was once here. Before casting a judging eye on another church, there is a question for consideration. Could the same thing that I'm talking about be happening right here at Gordon Avenue Baptist Church? Could we be so wrapped up in everything else that we're not on fire for God like we ought to be? My goodness, it gets quiet in a church when a preacher preaches this way. The third thing that I want to bring to your attention is this. Churches drift when they move away from soul winning. Listen to what L.A. Scarber said, a fine Southern Baptist. He said this, It is found that so long as the heart of an institution burns hot with the fires of soul winning, it is not likely to drift in its own theology. Our baptistry has been dry this year. Are we drifting away from soul winning? Number four. Churches drift when they consecrate themselves to maintaining the organizational structure instead of proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless God, there's some people worship the building more than they worship the God that's preached in the building. Arnold Cook said this. He said, as a result of their position on aging, aging side of the cycle, congregations are being sustained by their management rather than fueled by their vision. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. Generally, the more aged the congregation, the longer it takes to produce lasting change. And you know why that is? Because we get satisfied where we are. And we have the mentality and the attitude, bless God, mom and daddy did it this way and we're not going to do it any other way, preacher. In the words of my pastor, John S. Gibbs Sr., who is in heaven with the Lord now, Mama and Daddy or Grandma and Grandpa rode a horse and a buggy to church. Are you going to drive a horse and buggy to church? Number five. Churches drift when seminaries and Bible schools fail in their training of their leaders. Many seminaries today try to teach what's wrong with the Bible instead of everything being inerrant in the Bible. Number six, churches drift when Satan lulls us into a sleep as a church instead of experiencing revival. Now revival means to bring something back to life. And there was a time in the history of this church that we would have a spring revival and a fall revival. Now I want to confess to you that got to be a series of meetings more than a revival. And many of our Baptist churches continue to have their spring meetings and their fall meetings. 
And they call these meetings revivals. I preached a lot of revivals in my day. Let me rephrase that. I preached in a lot of meetings in my day. Now, I've been blessed to preach one or two revivals in 35 years and had some good ones. And I've been involved in some pretty good meetings. But I want you to know that revival means that something's got to be dead and brought back to life. As a believer, backslide, listen, they get to be like a corpse all over again. I'm going to say this, and uh, it's not going to be a popular statement, but as a church gets to be more and more and more and more deceased, it's no more than a living corpse. Dead people walking around in a dead I don't like it, preacher, when you preach like this. I've been so burdened, not only for our church, but for the church. Listen to this. George Barna said this. He said, in the frog in the kettle explained the drift in this way. He said, you place a frog in boiling water, and it will jump out immediately because it can tell that it's in a hostile environment. But you place a frog in a kettle of room temperature water and it will stay there content with those surroundings. Slowly, very slowly, you begin to increase the temperature of the water. This time, the frog doesn't leap out but it just stays there unaware that the environment is changing. Continue to turn the burner up until the water is boiling and the poor frog will be boiled, quite content, perhaps, but nevertheless, dead as dead can be. You see, that's what the devil is trying to do to the church today. He's trying to lull us to sleep. He's placed us in that lukewarm water and he constantly turns the heat up just a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And if it continues to go, he's just going to lull us to death and we won't ever accomplish anything for the glory of God. Number seven, churches drift because their leadership drifts. Arnold Cook said this, organizations don't drift, only their leaders. When there's backsliding in the pulpit before there's, I want you to know there's going to be backsliding in the pulpit before there's backsliding in the pew. Oh, preacher, be careful. You might be crucifying yourself. It's sad when a preacher's not on fire for God. It's sad when a preacher is preaching the gospel out of the financial gain that he may get to make a living for his family. And don't misunderstand me. I know the Bible says that God's man's worthy of his heart. But let me tell you something. There's some people standing in God's pulpit preaching for a job instead of preaching for the kingdom. Amen. God wants Holy Ghost fire-filled leadership standing behind the sacred desk of God to preach the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that's not happening, we find ourselves drifting. Number eight, churches drift when there's a lack of vision. I quoted this verse just a few moments ago. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. 
listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It didn't stop there. It says, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that doeth the things that the word of God says to us that we must do, happy is he or she. But where there is no vision, the people perish. Some people's got the attitude of me and my four and no more. My family's all right, and that's all that matters to me. God help us to have a burden for people. You talked about it a little bit this morning, Steve, when you were talking to the, about the children. Having an attitude of forgiveness. People is going to always be people. And people is going to always, from time to time, offend you. Because they're people. Y'all know how I know that? Because I'm one of you. I'm a person. I'm a people. And you see, our attitude as adults many times is uh, bless God I may forgive but I won't ever forget. What if the Lord had that attitude? Well, I may forgive your sin, but I won't ever forget your sin. The Bible says that he forgets our sin as far as east to west. Amen? Help us, help us to have a vision for people. I know that sometimes people are hard to deal with. I understand that. I've been dealing with people for 35 years or more as a pastor. I understand that. I won't ever forget when I was a young preacher with black hair a long, long time ago. Being hurt by people in a certain church. And my dear pastor was still alive at that time. And I called him and I said, Preacher, I quit. If people can treat a preacher of the gospel this way, I quit. And I ran and raved to him for about 20 minutes over the telephone, and he humbly, passionately, with a heart of compassion, listened to me. And then he said, are you through? I said, yes, sir, I'm through. He said, pick up your Bible. Go down to the church tonight and preach to the people because the people need to hear the word of God. And I know that you think you're that perfect preacher and that you're not like the people, but you're just a people person too. So go love and preach to the people. People are going to always be people. So love the people in spite of themselves and point them to the one who loves them more than you could ever love them. Have a vision for people. Number nine. Churches drift when they have a desire for the world and to be like everyone else. Now, look closely at what happened to Lot. Because the same picture is happening in the church world today. Lot looked toward Sodom. Why did he look toward Sodom, preacher? Because it looked good. So it looked so good that Lot chose ground near Sodom. In fact, the Bible says that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. 
And eventually he moved to Sodom and he dwelt there. And as he dwelt there, he began to be like the people of Sodom. He began to act like a citizen of Sodom. He gave his daughters to Sodom. He hesitated in leaving Sodom. Even when the angels delivered him from destruction, he still wanted to live as close to Sodom as possible. His wife didn't want to leave Sodom, so she looked back longing to be there, and she turned into a pillar of salt. We should fight against compromise and pull out of our church the things of the world. Jesus said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I dare say that you can walk into some churches and you wouldn't even know that it's a church. God help us to pull these things out. In the book of Judges, The appalling cycle of drift is repeated several times. The people fall into sin. God disciplines them from foreign oppression. The people cry out in repentance. God raises up a deliverer. Peace is restored. God provides them leaders called judges. But still every man decided they would do what was right in their own eyes. This is what's happening in our world today, in our church world. We do what we think is right in our own eyes. There is a way. This theme is right unto a man. But the ways thereof are the ways of destruction. The following adaptation from the historical drift is another illustration of the type of evidence of loss of commitment. Several of these are important, so I want you to hear them. Is my church drifting? Good question. If there is a lack of faith, my friend, of you as a church member, our church is drifting. Inconsistent church attendant tells me that our church is drifting. Quest for Fewer and shorter services tells me that our church is drifting. A lack of stewardship tells me that our church is drifting. People who are not faithful in tithing Giving of resources. Well, bless God, I knew the preacher was going to hit us about money before long. My goodness, all the Lord asks for is 10%. What in the world would we do if God decided he wanted 90% and gave us 10% to live on? But you see, God wants more than just the tithing of your money. I don't know about you, but I'm, I like air condition. Amen? Amen? Well, it takes money to run the air condition. I like not having to preach in darkness. Amen? It takes money to pay the light bill. I'm glad we got a new steeple and got it all painted and looking pretty and beautifying God's building. It takes money to do that. Having money. Now let me tell you something. God can take one dollar given with a right heart and do more with it than twenty dollars with a wrong that's given with a wrong heart. But God wants more than just the tithing of your money. He wants a tithing of your time and a tithing of your talent. And when that's not happening, that tells me that we're drifting. A lack of love and understanding for God's word tells me that we're drifting. 
When we fail to pick up a Bible and read the infallible truths of the pages of God's Word and depend upon a preacher to teach us and preach the Word of God to us, instead of reading it for ourselves, it tells me that we're drifting. Lack of biblical preaching tells me that we're drifting. More interested in the modern trends and the methods and the current events that surround us then doctrinal preaching and teaching tells me that we're drifting. A lack of worship tells me that we're drifting. Not interested in consecrating one's life and submitting to God tells me that we're drifting. A lack of prayer tells me that we're drifting. Is my church drifting? No interest in attending prayer meetings tells me that we're drifting. A lack of repentance among God's people tells me that we're drifting. No interest in deep soul searching conformity to the will of God and to the word of God tells me that we're drifting. Lack of evangelism tells me that we're drifting. Lack of telling people about Jesus and trying to get souls saved tells me that we're drifting. Having a lack of vision tells me that we're drifting. No involvement in outreach or missions tells me that we're drifting. A lack of holiness tells me that we're drifting. Now listen to me. The Bible says holiness without no man shall see God. And I'm not talking about a denomination either. I'm talking about the holiness of God that lives within one's heart. And last of all, when there's no apparent interest in godly living whatsoever, we find ourselves drifting. Is my church drifting? Listen to me, church. While we may not be drifting in some of these areas, we are drifting in many of these areas. God help us to repent and to awaken His holiness in our lives today. Stand with me. Father, a message like this is never an easy message to preach. But yet and still, O oh Lord, it's your word. And there's so much truth in it. Help us, O oh God, to see our need of repentance and revival in our land today, in our churches in our land today, in our own personal church today. Have your way during a time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.